Welcome back to this uh, second part of the course, Big Data. This is still a special lesson. It's unique in multiple ways, and I'm going to say it in order to not scare or bore anybody, because a lot of you will be either scared or bored in that lecture. The reason is simple. What I'm going to show here is basically a summary of the material that most of you will already have seen in the relational database lecture during your bachelors. So for most of you, there will be nothing new, it's just the, the good old relational material as a, as a brochure. For others, and I'm also thinking of, uh, of uh, maybe data science students who, who, who don't have a computer science bachelor because we have mathematicians, physicists, uh, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. So not all of you might have had a relational lecture and that's okay, that's totally okay because we will see that it's only a few things on the high level that you'll actually need to, to follow big data. I still encourage you to, 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 to look a bit at relational databases because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to catch up. I put a video on the Moodle uh, for that with, uh, with uh, information systems for engineers, um, but you'll see it will be easy to catch up because SQL, the language, uh, is relatively easy to use. Um, so this is why bored or scared. If you took a relational database, you're probably going to be bored. And if you never did, you're going to be scared by the speed at which I'm going to show you all of that. So don't be worried. This is the only lecture like that. And next week, when we start with cloud storage, this is all new material, normal speed, cruise, cruise mode. So everything will be back to normal. Okay. But still, I'll try not to scare you too much, right? So I'd still, I'd still be a bit careful. So this is Edgar Cole. He is the genius that figured out data independence, the separation between the logical and the physical layer. And pretty much everything followed from this, in the, from the seeding paper. And the paper is also on the Moodle for those interested to read it. Um, here's the idea of data independence. I told you I would repeat it all over again, right? So what do we have? We have the storage, this is how people did it in the 60s. You store the files directly on your hard drive. And then you use C++ or C. No, C++ didn't exist in the 60s. So I don't know, Fortran, COBOL, whatever they had in, the, in these good old times. Today, that would be Python, people using Python to directly query on the physical storage. But by doing that, you're actually breaking data independence because you're directly reading from the, from the disk. Data independence says you shouldn't be doing that. Data independence says what you should be dealing with is the data model, the table and the model related to tables, the relational model, the relational algebra to manipulate tables. I will show it today and tomorrow. Um, but everything that happens on the disk and in C++ and so on should be hidden from the user. You shouldn't have to see it. Why is that so great? Because then you can swap you might not believe me when I tell you that, but this is all implementable on clay tablets as well. You probably won't get the same latencies and response times uh, asking, I don't know, millions of people maintaining the clay tablets in the background. But in fact, this is how it was done back then, right? Thousands of years ago, this is how relational database were dealt with. Of course, they didn't have yet, you know, SQL and the relational model and so on, but they kind of already figured the idea of storing things in table. But basically, you see, the model is still the same. I can also use some spreadsheet software um, that could be seen as some sort of physical layer. I will also sometimes make analogy with, uh, with uh, you know, spreadsheet software and what we are doing. Be careful with spreadsheet software. Why is that physical layer? Well, some people learned it the hard way a few years ago when there was a database uh, I think based on which they did statistics that somebody offset a row with another one in Excel and it completely, you know, messed the data up and that ended up in the news. And that was actually bad publicity. Uh, it was a government uh, as far as I remember. This is the danger of not doing data independence, right? Because a spreadsheet is not made for actually manipulating data, especially at large scales. So this is why it's important. So if you use PostgreSQL or uh, MySQL or uh, uh, any, any technology, you would store it on a physical drive. This, this is 50 years old now, this, uh, this way of doing it. But now with big data, you can also switch in there to um, a data center or uh, many, many different machines. 
But look, there is something that never changed across these slides. Do you see the upper part? It's always the same, it doesn't change. That's the magic of data independence and why it is so important. And we're going to focus on both in every lecture and with every week. We're going to start with the logical layer, then I'm going to go to the physical layer. What we will see also is that the notion of logical and physical is actually relative. What I mean with this is that when you have a data model and you implement it somewhere, the place that you implement it on could itself have a logical layer sitting on a physical layer, right? So it's all modular. It's like playing Legos, right? So this is why the notion of logical physical, it's on, always depending on what you're talking about, right? But I'll come back to this. All right. And this, right, you can also use DNA. And again, it's the same, the same model relational tables. So if at the end, of the lecture, you, you see this, that data independence is so important and that it facilitates the understanding and the processing and the scaling up to think in that way about manipulating data, then I did it. This is what I want to transmit you. And I'm gonna argue that this is not just for tables, it's also true for trees and graphs and cubes uh, in exactly the same way as for tables, right? Remember five shapes, the tables, the trees, the cubes, the graphs and text. So in this brush up part, which will keep us busy today and tomorrow, I will focus on tables. Why? Because historically, since the 70s, this is what the focus has been on, actually for thousands of years. The other ones, they appeared a bit later, right? So tables are what is taught on the bachelor's level in computer science. So let's try to look a little bit at what we have. In a, in a database system. By the way, database system is the actual software that manages the data. Database is the data itself. That's a common misconception, right? Be careful. So database system is MySQL, PostgreSQL. It's a database system or a database management system. The database is the data itself. This here is a database. There is no software. This is a database. That's data. Okay. So, Typically, what we have is some storage it can be seen as something physical. That's where you store uh, everything. Compute is that would be C++, but it's still the physical layer, right? Compute and storage. So that let's say the C++ implementation of PostgreSQL working on your local hard drive. And then you have this line, the data, data independence line right here, where you have the model, the relational model in our case, and the language SQL or SQL. So what is a data model? Because since I talk about data independence, I like to focus on the data model in the language, right? So a data model is basically two things, typically. It's a, it's a description of what the data looks like, plus a description of what you can do with the data, how you can manipulate it, update it, query it, and so on. So it's these two things together. So you can actually make a direct analogy with cooking. Who likes to cook here or bake? Well, so you will understand immediately, right? So what does food look like? It's something that can be eaten. I would hope so. And then what you can do with it is all the vocabulary that you have in recipes, right? Mix, pour, break, dry, bake, grill, melt, mince, mix, and so on. This is all the vocabulary. That would be the cooking, the cooking algebra right here. And the cooking model, it's very simplistic, the cooking model, just what can be eaten. But that's basically the idea, right? And it's the same with data. And by virtue of data independence, the beautiful thing we can do is that back in the 70s, we had all of this implemented on a single computer, the CPU and the disk, that's old. And with big data, we can replace that with a cluster of machines and all kinds of technologies. We can even do it with more shapes. But look at this, all of that is the same. This is the magic of data independence. All we do is swap the underlying layer. So now I'm going to go through, we have 10 minutes left, I think. Um, I'm going to go through the concepts of the relational model, basically. And then we'll go through the relational algebra and we'll go to uh, the SQL language. Well, I have good news for those that I said are going to be scared because this, I can actually explain it quite simply. And the reason is that it's thousands of years old, right? So let me give you vocabulary. Um, 
this here that shouldn't surprise you is a table or relational table, right? Um, it's a, a list of uh, people. Uh, they have some ID here, a person ID. It's very common in database tables, in tables to call something a letter ID, right? It's just an identifier for whatever. The ID, person ID. Last name, first name, and then some, uh, some country. There are plenty of ways we can call that. Table is one of them. Relation is another one. Relational table is another one. Some technologies would call that a collection uh, and so on and so on, right? But it's fine. I mean, there can be synonyms in, uh, in real life, right? Uh, do we have questions on Zoom? I think I saw there was no question. Okay. All right. So this is a table, but look closer at the table. We take one row here. This is also called a record or an entity or a tuple. That's a mathematical word for that, a document. In some technologies, they call it a document, an item. And this is my absolute favorite. This is typically people who have an MBA. They call that a business object. <laughs> they, they, it's everywhere, like business objects. So a business object, if you ever hear this interacting with business people, it basically means a, a row in a relational table, right? It's a record. In that case, it's a person. All right. Then you have the columns, right? The columns, typically, it's called an attribute, like the first name is an attribute of a person, right? The last name is another attribute of a person. This is like vertical. So you see horizontal and vertical, right? This is a row, this is the attribute. Column, field, property, key. I don't know what MBA people call that. Maybe they have a fancy name. I don't know, like business property, or I don't know. But I, I don't know of anything official. Um, all right. And then some column or columns are special. And what makes them special is that they identify a row or a record or a business object. In that case, it's the person ID. What would that be in Switzerland, a way to identify a person living in Switzerland? Exactly, the, the AHAFO number, AVS, that's the social security number. So typically, if you go to the tax office, they probably have a database like that. I hope they are using a relational database system. Pretty sure they are. And in there, I'm pretty sure the AHAFO number, the social security number, is what there is in that column to identify a person. And because it identifies a person, if I give you the AHAFO number, you know who that is. This is called a primary key, or a row ID, or a name, or a key. There's many ways of calling that. But this is basically special. The first name, you agree, is not a primary key, right? If I just give you a first name, that's not enough for you to tell me who the person is. Maybe you want one to say, okay, then first and last name, maybe middle name, even that would technically be not good enough for the entire earth, right? So typically this is why we use the uh, uh, AHAFO number for people. But again, it's not just people, it can be anything you store in there. And in that case, you just need to figure out what the primary key is. Everybody's following? Okay. Even people who didn't take a relational database lecture. All right. Nobody seems scared. Now, if I take the intersection of a row in a column, I get what's called a cell. Uh, but it can also be called just a value or a scalar. It's also the fancy way. If you do a linear algebra, maybe it makes sense why it's called scalar. A cell, a characteristic, a fact, depending on the environment, okay? I'm not saying anything about what that value can be. I'm coming to it, right? This will, uh, this will come very soon. All right, it's pretty simple, right? Table has rows, it has columns, and some of the columns might be a primary key. Note that it can be several columns. In that case, it's just one, but it might also be that you need several identifiers. Example, for a car, the registration plate of the car, you need two things. You need the content plus the number. The content alone is not enough. The number alone is not enough. So it's two columns in the case of car registration. Okay, that was part one of my model is what does the table look like? The other part is what can I do with the table? And that I'm probably just going to start and continue tomorrow, but let me tell you a little bit. Um, in order to manipulate tables, I have bad news, actually for me it's great news because I love math, but maybe for you it's bad news. We need to do a bit of math and mathematical modeling for, uh, for saying what, uh, what a table is. Um, in many database textbooks that are out there and the way it's taught in many universities, 
a table is defined under, as a mathematical relation over domains. In fact, this is the reason why it's called relational databases, relational model, relational algebra. That's the reason, because it's a mathematical relation. So maybe for some of you, this is going to make sense, but basically a relation is a subset of the Cartesian product of the domains. Who understood this? Many of you, at least if you took discrete math, that would kind of make sense. Don't worry too much. It, it's totally okay if, 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 the, if, the, if the math doesn't make much sense. I'm just saying it for those who are interested. It will not prevent you from following the lecture. So don't worry about that. So basically the reason it's called relational database is that a table is a mathematical relation. Uh, when you have a Cartesian product, so the Cartesian product, that would basically be all the possibilities. And then you take a subset because of course in a table, you're not gonna have everything. You only have the actual records that are in the table. And in fact, the mathematical name for an element of the Cartesian product, what is it called? Yes? A tuple, exactly. And this is the reason why there was tuple in there, here, so so called the tuple there. That's the reason. Every one of these that is um, made of a value in every domain is a tuple. And so you can see then a table as a set of tuples, right? That's basically what it is. So this is the way it's typically taught. I don't like that it's taught that way. There are many issues with that. First, when you have Cartesian products like that, there is an order in the column. There is column one, column two, column three. And in fact, normally it shouldn't matter in the table, the order of the columns. So basically it brings a lot of imperfections in the model. And so this is why usually I prefer to explain it in this slightly different way, even though it's not that different. But basically when you have a relational table, typically you're gonna have the attributes. So you're going to say, for example, there is a column PID, a column last, a column first, a column country. And then you're going to have a set of tuples, a set of rows, if you prefer. But if you want to sound fancy, you can call them tuples. So here, how many tuples are there? Six, right? There are six tuples. And every tuple appears on a row. Now, I said set, bag, list, because we have a choice here. The difference between a set and a bag is that in a bag, you can repeat rows. So if you have a bag of tuples, which is one way you can do it, then you might have multiple times the same row, right? Some people might want that. Normally people use sets, but uh, some people might want to allow for repetition. If you have a list, you add something more that matters. It's the order of the rows. If you have a list of tuples, then it matters that the first one is Einstein, the second one is Arrange. If it's a set, you don't have duplicates and the order doesn't matter. Does it make sense? And we have a choice here. We can decide. We take set, bag, or list semantics, and we do what we want. Typically, in the early days of the relational model, it was presented as a set of tuples. But if you take a relational database management system like PostgreSQL, it's a list because the order actually matters, right? So just keep in mind a little bit of flexibility here. All right? I'm going to stop on that slide. So a relational table is just a set of tuples, or a bag of tuples, or a list of tuples. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you how we can manipulate tables, just like matrices or numbers or mathematical objects. And I'm going to introduce you to the SQL language or brush up on SQL. Thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, I'm going to see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'm pretty sure a lot of you will be on Zoom rather in the lecture hall, but still it's nice to be in the lecture hall as well. It's going to be right there in E5. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening, everybody.